As we return to our series looking at the major lessons in the Minor Prophets, we've come up to the prophet named Zephaniah. And I came across a quote that I forgot that I had in my files from my cousin, Dick Brogdon, in his book called Missionary God, Missionary Bible. And here's what he wrote. Since good news must often indeed rectify bad news, the gospel message is both warning and invitation. I was reminded of that quote because that is indeed what we discover in Zephaniah. He's got some really good news to tell us, but in order to make us see the good news and taste the good news and desire the good news, he has to confront us with some really bad news at first. Now, Zephaniah, if you will remember from our discussion of Habakkuk last time, Zephaniah and Habakkuk prophesied at the same time to roughly the same geographic area. In fact, let's look at the timeline that we looked at last week. You'll see that the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, uh, those two major prophets, they're there as well with Habakkuk and Zephaniah and also the prophet Huldah. And they are prophesying in Judah near the end of the uh, kingdom, before it, that red stripe at the bottom, before it goes into captivity. And you'll notice that Josiah is the last of the good kings of Judah. And the kings after him have a relatively short reign, many of them. And then they also uh, are really not making any pretense of trying to follow God. They're just evil all the time. So this is the environment that Zephaniah is speaking in. Now, I had shared with you last time that one of the ways that we need to keep things straight here in our minds as we're reading these is, Jeremiah, his main ministry was to faithless Israelites. And by that, we mean that if you go through the book of Jeremiah and read, you'll see the word backsliding a lot in there. He said these are people that have turned their back on God, on Jehovah. They no longer hold the faith that they used to have before. Habakkuk that we looked at last week, we said that his main ministry was to faithful Israelites. Israelites, those people that despite the evil culture around them, they were trying to hang on to God. And so Habakkuk's uh, message to them was one of encouragement. Hang on, remain faithful. But now that we come to Zephaniah, let me give you another F word. Zephaniah is mainly talking to fake Israelites. And by that, I mean, if we were going to use another word, we'd say hypocritical. These were Israelites that by their nationality, they would appear to have been followers of God. And maybe even on the outside, they might have had a little bit of pretense of following God. At least they kept some of the titles and some of the outward appearance. But the way that they actually lived their life and certainly what was going on in their hearts was nothing like a God follower should have. And so Zephaniah was addressing them. And again, Zephaniah wants to tell them, really good news, but he's got to tell them bad news first to get their attention about the good news. So Zephaniah introduces himself in an unusual way. Listen to his opening words, the very first verse of the first chapter. He says, the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah. Now, as far as we know, this would be the only prophet that has royal blood in his veins. Zephaniah traces his family lineage back to tell us that King Hezekiah, one of the really great kings of Judah and one of the kings that reigned the longest as a king, that that Hezekiah was Zephaniah's great, great grandfather. So we, we understand then where he's coming from. He still probably knows and is on a first name basis with many of the people that would be in uh, the, the royal throne room. But then he goes on to say this, that his, his time of prophesying was during the reign of Josiah. Now, remember on that chart we just looked at, we said Josiah was the last of those good kings. So I want to show you a couple of dates to help you kind of set the stage here that we're going to zoom in a little bit more on Zephaniah's life. So look at these dates. We already talked about that date over there on the far left, Josiah's reign as king. And then look all the way over to the far right. That is when Josiah's reign ends as king. Uh, He is killed in battle against the Egyptians. 
Back there at 627 BC, Jeremiah begins his ministry. But then look right after that 622 BC, it says that the book of the law is discovered. That is a pivotal moment, not only in the history of Judah, but specifically in the life of King Josiah. Let's go back and look at that story from the historical book of 2 Kings. It opens by telling us Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. Okay? It goes on then to tell us that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David— not turning aside to the right or the left. So here, here's this guy that he comes to the throne and he says, I'm going to do it the way that King David did, the one who's described as a man with his heart after God. And that became the measuring stick for all of the other kings. But 18 years later, we read that as he is starting to clean some things up in Judah, starting to do away with some of the idol worship and starting to uh, make sure that the temple is cleaned up. We read this account here. It says, Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law. Now, that's interesting. This thing has been, this would be our first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and it's been missing It hasn't been around. And Hilkiah says, I found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And he gave it to Shaphan, who read it. And then I thought that this is very interesting. Shaphan reads it, and then he goes to the king, and this isn't the story that he leads with. He gets to the king and says, your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king. It's almost like a, oh yeah, by the way. Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. He doesn't even tell him what it is. He's given me a book, and Shaphan read from it. Now, notice how Josiah responds. We've already been told that he's a good king. He's already doing good things. But when he hears the book of the law, here's what happens. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. That's a sign of mourning, a sign of, oh man, that we, we've been doing things wrong. And so he goes back to the priest and he says, I need you to pray. I need you to ask God, what are we supposed to do now that we've heard these, these words? And I realize, even though I have been up to this point, I've been called a good king, I still haven't been living up to, to God's words. What are we supposed to do? And Hilkiah, the high priest, reports back these words from God. God really says, Josiah, I've seen your heart. I love the humility of your heart. I love the fact that you have responded to these words that you've heard, and I'm going to bless you as a result of that. And so Josiah doesn't want to keep this news to himself. So in chapter 23 of 2 Kings, we read this. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, the priests, and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He said, everyone's got to hear this news. He read in their hearing all the words, read the entire thing, all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. And then he takes this stand. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments, regulations, and decrees with all his heart and with all his soul. And this is really where the revival begins. Now, somewhere along the line, then, Zephaniah's uh, prophetic writings begin. Um, I have a hunch that it wasn't right at the very time that uh, Josiah read these words and people started turning back to God. But I think that it was shortly after uh, Josiah's death when people said, you know what, Josiah's not around anymore, and we're just going to go back to doing it the way that we did it before. And and this grieves Zephaniah. It, it breaks his heart because he says, oh, we, you know, we were turning back to God 
All of us were starting to turn back to God, and we were getting rid of these idols, and now we're just going to throw that away. And so this is why Zephaniah said is really addressing fake Israelites, these people that on the outside, the priests are still wearing the priestly robes and tassels, and people are still going through the motions, but their heart's not in it. Their minds aren't in it. Remember, it just, we just said, Josiah said, I'm going to do this with all my heart and all my soul. People weren't doing that anymore. And so Zephaniah begins to write these words down for us. And if you go through uh, uh, your translation, whatever Bible, I'm, I'm looking at the New International Version right now, a good portion of the three chapters of Zephaniah are inside quotation marks because Zephaniah simply uh, just records for us that this is what God said. And it's interesting because as God will speak and then Zephaniah will speak and he will give us kind of an application. But it's interesting, this forward and backward looks that take place. God mainly, when he speaks, the parts that are in quotation marks are mainly getting us to look forward, look down the road and see what is coming. Something is coming. When God speaks, though, he frequently reminds us of things that have already taken place in the past, things that we already should know. Much like Josiah, when he read the book of the law, the covenant, he said, these are things in the past. I should have known these things. I should have been following these things. And so he was uh, then applying those. And so what Zephaniah does as God takes us forward and takes us backwards, but then Zephaniah tries to bring it right down to this is where we live today. Now, if you were with us before in, in our study of the Minor Prophets, when we talked about the, word, the, the book Joel, there's a phrase that Joel uses called the Day of the Lord, where Joel is looking forward to that final day, the final judgment of God. And uh, we're going to see that same phrase in Zephaniah. And Zephaniah really reaches the same conclusion that Joel reaches, which is saying the day of the Lord is coming. We can't stop it. It is coming in the future. But the real question is, what do we do today? How do we respond today knowing that that's coming? Again, let me, I'll repeat it again. Zephaniah says, I got really, really good news to share with you. But I got to tell you the bad news first so that you understand how good the good news actually is. So when he starts at the beginning of Zephaniah. He, he just goes right into it, starting in verse number two. It's in a quotation mark. It's already God speaking. And listen to the forward lick, uh, words of God and, and the things that he says is going to happen. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both men and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. The wicked will have only heaps of rubble when I cut off man from the face of the earth. I will, I will. This, this, the, those words keep on going on. I will punish. I will bring judgment. I will bring justice. And God is saying this is a day that's coming. You can't stop it from coming. But even in the words that he's sharing looking forward, God even tells us to look back. This is not something new that he's telling us, but he's calling us to remember what he's already told us. Just like Josiah read the book of the law. So God takes us back. When, when he is looking forward, he tells us, really, he's taking us back as well. So let me show you where he takes us back to Deuteronomy. In chapter 1, verse 13, God says this. This is a warning for these people that don't follow God, that are evil, that are not living righteously according to God's law. He says their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished. They will build houses, but not live in them. They will plant vineyards, but not drink the wine. Well, this takes us back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 30, when, listen to how similar these words are. You will be pledged to be married to a woman, but another will take her and rape her. You will build a house, but you will not live in it. You will plant a vineyard, but you will not even begin to enjoy its fruit. So as God says, I look forward to what's coming, he says, but let me take you back and tell you this is something I told you before. Listen, look at another example. Verse 17 of chapter 1, uh, Zephaniah quoting God says, I will bring distress on the people. They will walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like filth. Yuck. But listen again, what's written in Deuteronomy. At midday, you will grope about like a blind person in the dark. 
You will be unsuccessful in everything you do. Day after day, you will be oppressed and robbed with no one to rescue you. Interesting that, that, that God says, here's what's coming, and yet I already told you. Now, think about it this way. Here's what Zephaniah, in essence, is saying to the Israelites as he's writing these words to them. He said, if God said these words back in the day of Moses, that that's what would happen, and here we are all of these years later, think about how much more close this day of the Lord is now. Think about how much more attention we should pay to the way that we're living or the way that we're disobeying God's law. And you know what, friends? I would even take that forward now if we're 2,500 years after Zephaniah. How much more so should we pay attention to these words? How much more so are we close to this? Now, uh, Zephaniah's response, remember I told you he always kind of brings it to what do we do now? Listen to his response now. So this part isn't in quotation marks. This is Zephaniah's conclusion. Okay, I've heard what God said about what, what is going to come in the future. So here's what we should do right now. He says, gather together, gather together, O shameful nation, before the appointed time arrives and that day sweeps on like chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Doesn't that sound a lot like what we read about Josiah in 2 Kings? That seek the Lord before, turn the, have this humbling of your heart before, you know, and Josiah just tore the, his robes as that sign of mourning. And so Zephaniah really says, hey, this is how we should respond. We should, just like the king Josiah did, we should do the same thing before this day arrives. Because once the day arrives, we can't do anything about it at that point. So, uh, we start reading about God's judgment that's going to come on all of these nations that are surrounding them. Nations like um, Phil, the Philistine nation and Moab and a the Ammonites and Cush and the Assyrians, all of these people that were around Israel and were oppressing them. Isn't it interesting that God says to them in that, that verse we read from Deuteronomy that, um, that you, because you've been uh, oppressed, you think that that they're going to get all of the, the judgment falling on them. He says, but you're actually the one that has been doing the oppressing as well. Who have they been oppressing? Well, other people who wanted to follow God's laws and, and live according to God's standard, they were putting so much pressure on them to compromise, to give in, to, to go along with what they were doing. And so God says, it's you're going to reap what it is that you have sown. So this day of the Lord is coming. Now, like I said, you can fast forward. Now, if we go to the time of Jesus, Jesus also looks back to these words in Zephaniah and uses them as a warning about what's coming in this day of the Lord that we should pay attention to. These opening words from that are in the quotation marks of God speaking, let me read them to you again, where God says, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both men and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. The wicked will have only heaps of rubble when I cut off man from the face of the earth. This idea of this total punishment that, that is going to uh, fall on people. Well, here's what Jesus said. Talking about the end times, he says, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus also goes back to, there's another verse here in Zephaniah chapter 1 that's that he describes this way. It, it will be, he says, it will be a day of wrath, a day of distress, a day of anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, of darkness and gloom, of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry. You get the idea of, of what's going on. Well, again, Jesus in Matthew 24 says this, Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Now, 
last week when we were looking at the prophet Habakkuk, I told you, you should always pay attention when God says, whoa, when he says, oh man, woe on you if if this judgment, if this punishment falls. Well, Zephaniah uses that same word that we should pay attention to. Here's how he opens chapter three, woe to the city of oppressors. And you go, yeah, I wonder what city that is. But is it, is it, um, you know, Babylon? Is it, is it the Assyrians? Is it the Egyptians? No. He's speaking these words to the city of Judah. Woe to the city of oppressors. The ones that are oppressing people from following God. Rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Then he talks about the government officials. Her officials are roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning. Then he talks about the religious leaders. Her prophets are arrogant. They are treacherous treacherous men. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no wrong. Morning by morning, he dispenses his justice, and every new day he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous know no shame. He's speaking to the people that would call themselves God's people, but they're not living it that way. They're not certainly in their heart acting that way. Again, if we could modernize this, This would be Zephaniah saying, you know, you call yourself a Christian, but it's only in name, not in nature. You you haven't taken on the nature of Jesus Christ. You're just putting that label on yourself and saying, I am a Christian. But your heart doesn't act like it. Your mind doesn't think like it. And your body certainly doesn't act like it. The Apostle Paul, looking back at not only these events, but some of the other events in the history of Israel as well, told us that this was a warning for us to pay attention to. Listen to what he said. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil as they did. Listen to the evil that he talks about back then and think about how it's still how, how it looks like our culture today. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Listen again, he says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you, but what is common to men and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Therefore, my dear friends, in light of that, flee from your idolatry. Flee from putting something else in the place where God should be. But he said these were written as warnings to us. These things all happened as warnings to us. I like how Eugene Peterson captures this in the message paraphrase. Listen to this. These are all warning markers. Danger! In our history books, written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes, our positions in the story are parallel. They are at the beginning, we are at the end. And we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. So forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Instead, cultivate God confidence. So I told you. Zephaniah had to tell us the really bad news. What's the bad news? Well, it's captured in the words of the Apostle Paul as well. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's righteous standard. And the penalty of that sin is death. And that's what Zephaniah says. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of judgment is coming. We won't be able to talk our way out of anything. We won't be able to plead ignorance. Oh, God, I didn't know that I I was doing something wrong. There's no excuses. There's no justifying. There's not one thing that you and I have done that God has missed. He's seen it all. 
and he's kept track of it all. We are liable to the judgment. But here's the really good news. Zephaniah, looking forward to what Jesus would do for us, said these words, quoted these words from God. Then I will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. On that day, on that day of the Lord, you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me because I will remove from the city those who rejoice in their pride. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and the humble who trust in the name of the Lord, the remnant of Israel who will do no wrong. They will speak no lies, nor will deceit be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. See, that's what Jesus did for us. He allowed all of the punishment for our sins to fall on him. My friends, listen, this is not uh, when we invite Jesus to come into our life, when we pray a prayer and ask God to forgive us of our sins, because of what Jesus did for us, that's that's not uh, a past that exempts us from righteous living. We don't want to be fake Christians, just have the name of Christ stamped on us, but then we live like we're not following him. Now, Peter told us this at the end times. Listen to these words. He says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray, for it is time for judgment to begin with evil people. Nope, that's not what he says. It is time for judgment to begin with God's household, those that call themselves followers of Jesus. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? We need to change some things in our lives, friends. Let me be more personal. I need to change some things. It needs to be an ongoing process. So, Based on what we read here, can I share with you four thoughts of things that we need to do? Number one, listen to this word. L- l- look at how Josiah changed when he heard these words. He was already a good king. He was trying to do things the right way. But when these words came, when, when you hear the words of God, hear them to you, spoken to you. Don't, don't listen to a sermon or read something in the Bible and say, oh, my neighbor needs to hear this. <laughs> Boy, these this really describes my coworkers. No, read this word. Listen to the words of sermons. Listen to the words from God and say, that's spoken to me. I, I need to hear this for me. That's number one. Number two, then, is when you read this word, you need to examine yourself. You need to say, if this is the perfect measurement of how I'm supposed to live, how actually am I living? Listen again what what, uh, Zephaniah told us. We looked at these words already. He said, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. We have to be humble about it. You who do what he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Okay, listen to the words of God then in chapter 3. I will leave within you the meek and the humble who trust in the name of the Lord. See, what God is looking for is a humble response a humble response that says, you know what, I need to, I need to res- respond differently. I, I, now that I've heard God's word, I need to live differently. I need to make some changes. That word repent just means I'm on this path and I need to turn off of that path. That's what it means. Repent means turning around, get, getting on the right path. The third thing that I think we need to do is respond like Josiah did. Now, of course, we see the, the humbleness of his response. And the, the, yes, he tore those royal robes. But I also like the commitment. He stood up in front of other people and said, listen, I'm making a commitment. I'm making it public. I'm going to follow. Did you remember those words? He says, I'm going to follow all of the words in the, wor- in the law here. We've said this so many times, friends. If you've, if you've heard me speak before, I hope that you've heard this before and you don't get tired of hearing this. But the New Testament never talks about the word saint in the singular. It's always in the plural, saints, because we need one another. See, I, I need you. to. I need to make a commitment 
publicly in front of you. And I need to say, would you help hold me accountable? I, I, I read something here and I, I don't think I've lived up to this. And so here's the change that the Holy Spirit has speaking to, spoken to my heart. And I'm going to try to live this differently. Will you hold me accountable to this? And, and likewise, you need me to do that. That's what saints do for each other. It's iron sharpening iron. It's us encouraging and strengthening each other. It's being able to come to a friend and saying, you know what, I, I think I blew it. Uh, would you would you pray with me? Would you help me in, in this? And I want to do better going forward here. So, and that's what Josiah did. So, number one, hear the word of God spoken directly to you. Number two, when you hear that word, examine yourself. Say, how does my life measure up to what I just heard in this word spoken to me? Number three, make a public commitment about the change that you're going to make. Share it with a friend. And then number four, you got to stay diligent. This is not just a one and done. You don't just pray one prayer and just go, well, that's it. I'm done. I don't I don't have to pray anymore. I don't have to struggle with this anymore. I'm, I'm all set. The writer of Hebrews tells us this. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, of what we have heard so that we don't drift away. See, that's what happens. Most people, it's not just a they fall off the edge of the cliff. No, most people, it's a drift. They just are going with the flow, and they go with culture's flow that is going away from God. Be, you have to be so diligent that you don't drift. I, I want to remind you of these words again. This is what God, how he's describing the people whose hearts that he's purified. Listen to what he says. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will speak no lies, nor will deceit be found in their mouths. Okay? There, there's a change that has come about in their life. To listen to what the Apostle Paul says to us in the book of Ephesians, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice for God. Now listen to these words that echo what God said in Zephaniah. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. There should be no obscenity, no foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this, you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Okay, so we have to be very careful that we don't drift. So pay attention to what you're saying, what you're doing, what you're thinking, so that you're not drifting away. Hear God's word for you. Examine your life to see where you are. If you need to make a change, go public with it. Get an accountability partner, a friend, and then stay diligent. Don't compromise. Don't give in. Listen to the words that are coming out of your mouth. And if you need to repent, if you need to change, then do that. Listen to what the, I want to close with these final words, probably some of the best good news that Zephaniah shares. And these are our words right from God. And he says this, the Lord, your God is with you. He is mighty to save. (laughs) I love this line. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. What an amazing thought, friends, that God delights in you and he sings a love song for you. And I bet because he's so creative, that he's got a love song for you that's totally different than the love song that he sings about me. When he sees you, when he thinks about you, he has a a song that he sings just for you. And that's great news. But we got to confront the bad news, that the world, the flesh, the devil is going to seek to pull us away, seek for us to go along with culture, to drift And if we're not careful, we'll become fake Christians. We'll become hypocritical Christians. We just got the name, but not the nature of of Jesus. Listen to the word for you. Measure yourself by that word. Make a commitment to somebody of what you're going to do different. And then be diligent. And as you do that, friends, the more that you do that, the more you're going to hear God singing this love song over you. It'll That song, you'll, you'll be more and more tuned into it and you'll be able to hear it. As always, I'd love to be able to, to dialogue with you, answer any questions that you have, reach out to me, leave me a comment, and I definitely will get back to you.
Lord, thank you for my friends. Thanks for this good news, but thank you as well for the bad news that confronts us and makes us realize that there is a day of judgment coming, and we don't want to uh, be caught up in that judgment. We don't want to be swept away with the wicked people like, like this word tells us. How close is that day? If, if Zephaniah 2,500 years ago could say that the day was close, if Jesus and Paul could say that the day was close, how much more so now is the day so close? So would you help us, Lord, to listen to the word and then confront us? If there is that wickedness, or if there's that place where we've not kept your word, if we've not lived up to that, show us where it is so that we can repent from that. Help us to share our commitment with those around us that will strengthen us and and help us as we go forward. And then above all, help us to remain diligent. Stay close to you so that we don't drift away. We look forward to that day, the day of the Lord when it comes and it holds no fear for the righteous. But instead, we'll hear your voice saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome home. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you, friends. I love you.